Hi, I am Melvin Robinson, and this is the first episode of Burning Questions. It is the Mississippi Cannabis Industry Podcast presented by the Mississippi Cannabis Trade Association. Again, my name is Melvin Robinson. I am the Director of Communications and Media for the Mississippi Cannabis Trade Association. Uh, you might be wondering, okay, what is this? So this is basically a weekly podcast featuring different people within the cannabis community in Mississippi. And we're here to educate and entertain about all of the aspects of the Mississippi cannabis industry. Uh, we come on Facebook Live and YouTube every Tuesday at 7 p.m. And that's where we're doing. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, I really want to thank you all for everyone who's watching. Uh, please, our comment section is open. We have already taken questions for this particular event, but you are free to uh, conversate between, between yourselves in the comments and everything like that. And who knows, you might even see your uh, comment pop up on the screen. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to talk about some events that we have going on as far as the MSCTA. And we have a uh, Mississippi Cannabis Business Workshop. The Mississippi Cannabis Business Workshop will focus on the keys to strategies and success. This event is designed to provide support for Mississippians seeking to secure a cannabis business license in Mississippi. The workshop will provide a clear understanding of the licensing process in Mississippi, access to legal professionals in the cannabis field, and key strategies that strengthen your license applications is going to be going on May 20th. The link is will be in the comments uh, below. And uh, we have very limited seating, so make sure you get to that event right. Make sure you sign up, and it is absolutely free. Also, we have the Mississippi Cannabis Expo, uh, Cannabis Meets Healthcare. That is going to be taking place July 7th through 9th at the Biloxi Gulfport Convention Center. It's going to have exhibits, live speaker sessions, networking, giveaways, and more. It's going to be at the Gulf Coast Coliseum again. That is 2350 Beach Boulevard, Biloxi, Mississippi, 39531. For further information on exhibiting, sponsoring, speaking at, or attending the Cannabis Meets Healthcare slash Mississippi Cannabis Expo, taking place on July 7th through the 9th at the Biloxi Gulf Coast Convention Center, please contact Maureen at 702 702- 337-1965 or email at marine at kennel1.com. The website for all the information is www.kennel1 C-A-N-N-A zero, I'm sorry, O-N-E dot com. All right, great. So, uh, we have that out the way and what you all are here for tonight is a virtual patient workshop. So, what I am going to do is I am going to bring over our guest for this evening. Let me do that now. Boom. And there we are. There we are. So what I'm going to do, I have been talking for about four minutes straight. I am going to let these wonderful people come on and tell you who they are and what they do. So please go ahead. Okay. Well, I am Angie Calhoun. I'm the founder and CEO of the Mississippi Cannabis Patients Alliance. And our association is a nonprofit and we represent the patients of Mississippi. And so uh, I'm really thankful to be here with you, Melvin, tonight and to help inform our patients and people about how to get a medical cannabis card and what other, other, other questions they might have. And, and I've got Dr. Nathan McIntosh with me. Hey, hey, Melvin, thanks for having us on. Um, I'm a practicing physician in Mississippi for uh, maybe about the last uh, 12 or 13 years, and I also serve and work on the board with Angie so that we can kind of try to improve the dialogue uh, really as an advocacy for patients and answering questions about getting a card, but really not just about how to get the card, but how to maintain their health and as they use cannabis, using it appropriately and how to navigate the medical system and somewhat the dialogue with the cannabis industry to make sure that they're getting the most quality product that they can and, and for what they need it for. Well, uh, Ms. Calhoun and Dr. McIntosh, thank you all for coming on. Uh, Angie, we have been in constant communication, doing a lot of things. Um, I met you at your, at your announcement at the West End about the uh, Cannabis Patient Alliance, and I was like, hey, she, she seems very serious about this, so I want to make sure I could support her in any way that I could. And, yeah, I'm just glad I could have you both on right now. Oh, it's our well, pleasure. You. Yeah. 
So, uh, Ms. Calhoun, if you would, can you explain to people what exactly the Mississippi Cannabis Patient Alliance uh, does? Yeah. And so, like I said, we are a nonprofit and we are there to represent the patients. We're there to help inform them about not only the rules and regulations, but the law, um, about do's and don'ts and of using medical cannabis. And so, you know, we, we try to bridge the gap between, you know, the uh, physicians and then into the industry to make sure that, you know, the industry is producing safe, clean products for our patients, that they have ease of access to getting to their physicians and their medicine. And so if there are any, you know, hoops and hurdles that patients might have to jump through, well, that's what we're here to help eliminate. And so we have like patient navigators who will actually work with patients to help get them through, you know, the arduous task of getting a medical cannabis card, um, where they should go, uh, safe places, and, you know, and, and holding the industry accountable to make sure that they are producing safe, clean products for our patients. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. Um, I really love all the advocacy that has been going on, uh, you know, since the initial 65 vote. And so now, and I'm really happy to see people coming together in the state, making sure that we have a very strong and robust program. Um, Dr. McIntosh, if you don't mind me asking, um, how did you decide that you wanted to become a provider for uh, patients? Well, you know, I think it really centered around more about just the advocacy for access. And so my background has always been in emergency medicine. That's what I did my training in. And so uh, I guess at a core, it's always been about making sure people that may not have another place to go, um, or even if they do, that it's still always a resource. And so that's kind of what emergency departments are. And then seeing that there's actually a large cohort of patients that not just qualified, but really depend on or would need the benefit that some medical cannabis can provide. And so then in speaking with others and with Angie to have that opportunity to help do that and just kind of advocate for that um, selection of patients that are in need, uh, you know, it's just kind of a natural fit, I suppose. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, I, again, I just want to thank you all both for being involved. All right. So we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. All right. Where would you like to start this, uh, Miss Calhoun? Where, where, what you want to talk about? All right. Well, let's talk about um, maybe first of all, a big question, a burning question is, you know, the steps towards getting a medical cannabis card. And so something that patients can be doing right now is actually collecting their information, their medical records and getting, you know, that ready. I would suggest putting them in a folder or binder because when they get ready to see that medical cannabis physician or practitioner, that they will need some documentation to look back and say, oh, well, you know, you do have a debilitating medical condition. And so, and of course, on our website and on many other sites, you can see those 20 plus debilitating medical conditions that do, uh, you know, will help certify you as a patient. And so once you get that appointment with a credentialed uh, Mississippi medical cannabis uh, physician or practitioner, you'll be able to go in and see them. They'll need that documentation in order to certify you. And so, um, you know, it's just really important to have that and to get established with those physicians. And I'm looking here and I'm just going to go over the um, the qualifying conditions. Uh, the Mississippi Medical Cannabis Act allows patients who have a qualifying deliberate, uh, deliberating medical condition to be certified by a MDOH credential medical cannabis practitioner. And those are cancer. Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, muscular dystrophy, glaucoma, spastic, spastic quadriplegia. I, I am not a, I am not a uh, doctor, so please do not take my uh, pronunciation uh, is correct. But we do have them on the screen right here. Uh, HIV, um, AIDS, hepatitis, ALS, Crohn's disease, uh, colitis, sickle cell anemia. Alzheimer, Alzheimer's disease, uh, dementia, post-traumatic stress syndrome, autism, 
praying ref refractory to appropriate opioid management, uh, neuropathy, spinal cord disease, or the treatment of these conditions, a chronic terminal or de debilitating disease or medical condition or treatment that produces one or the more of the following. All right, so uh, we have all of those there. Let me ask you a question, uh, Dr. McIntosh. Do you see these uh, regularly, these conditions? Yeah, you know, we'll see them at least um, in an emergency department setting. It's usually for an acute exacerbation of some of these. And so whether it's somebody with pain and they're having kind of an acute exacerbation of pain that's not controlled with their medicines or uh, neuropathy is obviously a common one. Um, things that are refractory to, we'll say, conventional medicines. And, and there are prescription medicines available for uh, a lot of these conditions and for things like neuropathy, but still may not be quite the benefit. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously patients uh, on chemo that are having just uncontrolled or intra intractable nausea and vomiting despite taking uh, prescription medicines. And so we'll see those in the ER and then they're obviously very commonly seen in our clinics throughout the state. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have these 22 conditions. Are there any conditions? And this is another question for you, uh, Dr. McIntyre. Are there any conditions you would like to see added to this list? Yeah, you know, I think that there probably are. I think the more appropriate thing would be to start here and then to start enrolling patients into research. And so you have a little bit more evidence-based medicine to support the current conditions and then see where that goes to expand on. And, you know, and I think the evidence will show there'll probably be other conditions that can be added. Um, I, I think from our standpoint and advocacy, it would be more uh, providing that research and evidence that supports the conditions that are there and then seeing what can be added after that. For sure, for sure, for sure. Okay, great. Um, so, um, we have these conditions and everything like this. Uh, if someone decides, hey, I want to go, I got all my stuff and everything, I'm going to my doctor, what is something they can talk to their doctor about uh, medical cannabis? What, like what condition or, you know, I, I think maybe just to generally answer that question first, as a physician, you know, I, I would treat it as any condition and whatever the patient is pursuing uh, regardless, right? So whether you have, uh, you think you have hypertension and you're coming for blood pressure medicine or heart disease or diabetes, you know, if you think that you have a condition or you know that you have a diagnosed condition that is a qualifying condition, I would be prepared to come to see a physician and uh, just like you would any other physician or family practitioner or specialist that you see and just be able to provide a history of your condition, um, especially if you have any kind of medical documents or prior clinical notes from physicians that you've seen or test results. You know, those are all be very important for this physician that uh, the patient is going to see to, one, uh, confirm that they have that diagnosis or qualifying condition. Uh, and then two, to look through the treatments that they've had and see what's been successful or unsuccessful to see if uh, cannabis is the right answer for them. And so just because they have a qualifying condition, you know, I think any physician is going to still weigh what they think is best for that patient. And that'll be a discussion that would be between the patient and the physician. And so I would like, I would personally, and I think, you know, for most physicians, they would want to see uh, any kind of medical history, uh, subjective and objective, that the patient can provide so they can kind of come together with a treatment plan, uh, if it is cannabis or not. Okay, great, great, great. All right, so right here, I have a Q&A from your site, um, Ms. Calhoun. Can, you can see this, correct? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So uh, getting your registry ID card, and we're just going to look at the uh, FAQ that you have here. Um, a lot of people are asking, where would you get your registry ID card from? And that would be from the Department of Health and everything. All right. And I uh, do want to note that they made it very clear that all applications will be online. There will not be any paper uh, applications. And so we do want to just point that out. All right, so no paper app, paper applications, but it will be online. So if they're going to be online at uh, the Mississippi Department of Health's uh, medical marijuana site, because I know they do have a site that's strictly for their medical marijuana department. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, great. All right. So um, 
They'll begin issuing registry ID cards as early as June the 3rd, 2022. And this is for all of the products that you could purchase under the Mississippi Medical Cannabis Act. All right. Uh, the fees right here, qualifying patient registry identification card application fee is $25 and renewal of this identification card is $25. Is that an annual renewal or, or how does yeah. that it is an annual renewal fee. And so, you know, and of course the patient will also have to go back, you know, to see the physician as well annually, but there is also the six month um, visitation to where they will have to go back to see their, their physician. But the card is an, an annual fee is on there. And so, um, and you'll see that for our Medicaid um, patients that that fee is reduced. And then for disabled veterans and uh, rescue workers, they actually can get a free card. And so we're thankful to have that in there for those people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. OK, now this is one thing in a question that I have received. Will my insurance pay for medical cannabis? I see it says no right here. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, there's just not because it's still federally illegal. Most insurance companies are not going to pay for it. In fact, I mean, I don't know of any other state where any type of insurance covers your med medical cannabis. And so even though we see it as medicine and it will help a lot of sick people, the insurance is just not going to cover it. So it will be out of pocket. However, um, there are some efficacy driven discount incentives that um, could come about and that you can partake in uh, like a research study and therefore then you could get a discount on your medicine. So we, you know, really advocate for um, more and more research to be done so that we can get some real world data to prove the efficacy of medical cannabis for sick people. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, can I smoke or consume medical marijuana in public? Well, that's a big no. You're not supposed to consume or smoke in public. And that is, is that way in most states. So we're not unique in that. And so, um, you know, it would always be for me, I would suggest that, you know, you do it in private. Um, you know, if it's smoking, you're, you're going to need to do it, um, you know, at home or somewhere that, um, you know, there's not a non-smoking clause you know, to be addressed there. And so it's, it's, it's also so very important to make sure that, you know, patients don't get behind the wheel of a car or heavy equipment while they're impaired, because we would never want anybody to get hurt. And so we want to, you know, just make sure that, because obviously if you're in public, you may be driving and that's a big no-no. Okay. And one big question that was a point of debate that I've seen online. Um, can medical cannabis patient be administered medical marijuana while at school? Yes, they actually can as long as they have a medical cannabis card. And, um, you know, because if you think of a seizing patient, well, I mean, shouldn't they have the right to use their medical cannabis at school? But now that has to be administered through like the school nurse. It's not going to be just sitting out where, you know, just anybody can go up and get it. And, you know, it, it will be done in the right way. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm just thankful that the patients, our young patients will still be able to get their medicine while at school. And it's very important. Oh, surely, surely, yes. Um, and can my employer fire me for being a patient under the MMCA? Yeah. Well, not necessarily for being a patient, but if you do test positive for marijuana, medical cannabis, then they could fire you. They could have a zero tolerance policy for it. So I would recommend that, you know, you find out ahead of time what your company's um, policy is. And then also, you know, just kind of instigate a conversation with them to see if they might be open to that use. I know uh, there are several 
uh, small companies that are taking a new approach and looking at it as like, you know, I know this person is an excellent worker. So why wouldn't I want to give them the opportunity to do, to be that great worker? And so, you know, we could actually be putting a lot of sick people back to work if the employers will be open and receptive. And there again, of course, you know, I would never want somebody totally impaired on the job. You've got to be able to work. But, you know, if you were to use it and let the, um, the THC high get over with and go to work and be able to function there, that would just be so tremendous to see the socioeconomic benefits of that. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. And uh, but, yeah, what the bill definitely gives the employer the right to fire. And here I was reading about uh, people between the ages of 18 and 25. Can you explain that about obtaining a medical card if you're under the age of 25? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you if you're under the age of 25, they have put in the bill um, a clause to where you would have to see a a true doctor and then get another follow-up with a practitioner and so um, and that is to prevent you know like a lot of our younger generation from potentially just you know going out and you know just trying to get cannabis for recreational purposes which this is a totally a medical program and I, I just reiterate the importance of of that, that it is, it is truly medical. And so that is just to prevent um, some of our young people from taking advantage of the situation. Yeah. And you bring that up to make sure, you know, the point is that this is a medical program. I remember the debate uh, during initiative 65 and then after initiative 65 was struck down doing the debate about the NMCA and, you know, you would hear things like, Hey, an ounce of an ounce of cannabis is as big as a loaf of bread, and things like that, and you know, just kind of ridiculous stuff. But it yeah. is truly a medical program, and you know, we really want to make sure people understand this. Like, this is for people with these conditions that cannabis can help with for sure. It certainly can. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Dr. McIntosh, I'm going to jump back to you uh, really quickly. Um, so looking at everything here with uh, the FAQ here and you being on the board of the um, Cannabis Patient Alliance, um, what's some of the questions that people ask you that you would like to answer for a wider audience about the program or about medical cannabis? I think more just about the program that it's like Angie said, this is strictly a medical program and that's what we're advocating. And so it's strictly for patients that have a medical need for medical cannabis and that we're advocating for them and we're trying to provide as much knowledge, medical knowledge um, and other things. And so that's why on the FAQ, there's a lot of other kind of legal questions and employer questions and things like that. And so we're trying to be a source that um, you know, one-stop shop, so to speak, that patients can come to and try to find out as much information that they can that would affect them. But um, on the other side of that coin or line is being able to provide as much information we can to the medical community. And so there's a lot of resources. And of course, the Mississippi Department of Health is providing continuing medical education and requires a certain uh, number of hours of those CMEs uh, for a provider to be able to even certify um, but, and the state medical association is working through them to provide some of those CMEs and education. And so we're going to be working to advocate to make sure that physicians have access to that too. And all providers and kind of the do's and don'ts and whatever information we can get them to make it easier for them to understand, uh, the medical legal side, but also what is beneficial, what is not. And as ongoing research is going, um, with our state and what we'll be enrolling patients into trying to get them as much real-time information uh, as we can. No, oh. have other, uh, and of course you don't have to say any names or anything, but have other medical providers been, you know, asking you questions about um, possibly being a, a provider or have they shown a lot of interest in that? 
Yeah, you know, several, um, but even not even asking me personally, uh, there's obviously been an interest in patient or physicians uh, across the state uh, trying to sign up to get these CMEs so that they'll be able to qualify to be a uh, certifying prescriber. Um, and then there's just been kind of a large subjective interest in general. And so um, I, I think that you'll see maybe in the first year or a couple years, at least a decent percentage of providers that will become certifiers. And I think as more true evidence comes out, you'll start to see more people in the medical community um, make kind of uh, maybe a little bit more uh, favorable decisions on how they feel about cannabis in certain conditions. Um, not all, but I, I think the research will help that. Mm, that's great. That is great. And uh, Ms. Calhoun, um, you know, you've been doing this great work with the Cannabis Patient Alliance and everything like this, but this is also personal for you, correct? Yeah, Melvin, it, it truly is. Um, as most people know, uh, almost nine years ago, my son Austin suddenly became very ill with a several debilitating medical conditions. One was seizure disorder. The other was just chronic and severe pain in his joints. And then um, also dealing with um, horrible nausea and vomiting. And he had lost about 40 pounds. We later found out that he had contracted Lyme disease. It had become chronic, which makes it very difficult to get rid of. And so um, after he had seen over 22 doctors in about 18 months, and they had him on 17 pharmaceutical drugs to take every day. My husband and I just were very uncomfortable with that and felt that it was very unhealthy for our 17 year old to be taking that many pharmaceutical drugs, some which had lifelong side effects. And so through a lot of prayer and a lot of research, we as a family with Austin made the decision to let him try medical cannabis. We made the trip to Colorado where we could buy it legally. And it was recommended for him that he vape it because when you have chronic nausea and vomiting, then that is the best way for you to get it into your system. Because obviously, you know, if you were to eat an edible, then it's probably not going to stay down long enough. And so it truly was just wonderful within less than a minute, it felt like of Austin using the medication, it was just like he had life back in him. And I'll just never forget that moment. And he did get the munchies and he was ready to go and eat. But for the first time in a very long time, we were able to go to a restaurant as a family. He was able to eat. I let him order whatever he wanted. I was like, just eat it. And, uh, and he did. And so, and that food was, a, he was able to keep that down. And so it was so great to have his body be nourished by that food. And so it wasn't too many uh, months later, Austin just decided that he wanted to improve his quality of life and be able to get the medication that he needed legally. And so he did move to Colorado and stayed there for many years. And so um, we saw his quality of life return. He was able within a few months to rejoin the workforce. Um, he's still working and he's getting married this fall. And so we're so excited and thankful to see him you know, be able to enjoy life and have the quality of life that all patients do deserve to have. And we want that for all patients to be able to get legal medical cannabis right here in Mississippi. That's wonderful. That That is that is really wonderful. That is really inspiring. Um, and again, like I said before at the beginning, just seeing how involved you were, seeing how active you were and making sure that we had very robust patient access is just, you know, expiring. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. Thank you for being a voice for the patients of Mississippi. I cannot thank you enough. Oh, Melvin, thank you so much. And I appreciate all that you're doing to help inform the patients and the public in Mississippi. And um, for my patients, just know I'll never, ever give up fighting for safe, clean access to medical cannabis in our state. And, you know, I have great board members like 
Dr. McIntosh to keep me in line and make sure that, you know, they, they support this and they want to see this, this medical cannabis program succeed. And so we are going to do everything that we can to make sure that this program works for the patients of Mississippi. That's, that's incredible. That is incredible. And when I look at the site here, I want to bring it up again. Um, you all have resources that people can go to and search, um, Updates from the Department of Health, frequently asked questions, uh, medical marijuana for can for cancer, chronic pain, epilepsy, nausea and vomiting, multiple sclerosis, sickle cell anemia, all of these things. You also have patient stories and leader perspect uh, perspectives. Um, th this is a lot. It, it looks like this keeps you very busy. Yes, it does. <laughs> Definitely, but I'm, I'm up for it and we have a lot of great programs that we are excited that are about to come to fruition and that will help our patients so much. And so just, you know, just stay in touch with that website and we'll release that information as soon as we're able to. Great, great. And what I want to do just one more time for people just coming in, if you could, because we get, went over the website, we went over some questions and answers and everything like that. And, you know, I, I still want to take some questions from you, but I just want to make sure people know. All right. What would be the process of actually getting a card? OK, so what you need to be doing right now is go ahead and getting your medical records together. There will also be a list out very soon of credentialed medical cannabis practitioners. And so you're going to want to make an appointment to see that practitioner so that you can be certified, but you do need to take your medical records with you to show that you have a debilitating medical condition. And so once you get that certification, the doctor will send it in to the Department of Health. You'll be able to go online, online only, no paper, um, through the Department of Health website and fill out your application. And um, they are going to get those uh, certifications back out to you within five to 10 days. They actually have a 30 day window in the bill, but um, I've been speaking with Chris Jones with the Department of Health and they are very, very committed to getting those cards out to our patients very quickly. And so I'm thrilled about that and to know that they won't have to wait 30 days to get their card. Indeed. So then you can go find a truly licensed medical cannabis dispensary, somebody that has grown and processed uh, that, that product in Mississippi. It will be tested by some state-of-the-art testing facilities. So our patients will know that they're getting clean product. They will know how much THC and other cannabinoids that will be in those products and what terpenes and, and other things. So, you know, those COAs will come with the, the product. And so the patient will know exactly what they're getting and will know that it's free of molds and pesticides and herbicides and other contaminants that could harm patients. We don't want to make sick people sicker. We want to make them healthy again. Indeed, indeed. And while we're here and we're going to be wrapping up soon, uh, let's dispel some rumors and myths you've heard, because I know you've heard plenty, and we talked about yeah. it before, but yeah, what, what's some things you've heard you just want to make sure you get cleared up? Yeah, so one thing is, um, uh, I had a patient recently to ask me, does she have to use an opioid before she can get medical cannabis? And the answer to that, and I've confirmed it, is that is a no that she, you do not have to be on opioids before you can use medical cannabis. And so um, that, you know, to me would kind of sort of defeat, you know, we don't want people to get addicted to opioids. So um, medical cannabis is a, a real medicine that will help people with that pain and not have some of the severe side effects that opioids have. So, so I'm thankful for that. Um, another rumor that's been going around is that um, patients could potentially be uh, use the telehealth to do their, their first visit. And 
from all indications that's not going to happen. We hope in the future that it will. And potentially you may could do that for your six month follow up. And it is very important for our patients to do that six month follow up because your doctor does need to know how the, the cannabis is working for you or if it's not. And he can make some other recommendations that may be the wellness agent at the dispensary, you know, may not know about. But, um, you know, and one good thing is that these dispensary agents, they are going to be uh, knowledgeable sales staff. Um, we're super excited to hear that they, they are um, mandated to have uh, five hours of training. But I hear that a lot of other dispensaries are requiring even more training for them. So that's, you know, that's great because that's the first main point of contact that our patients have with the product and we want them to be as informed as possible. Oh yeah. You definitely want them to be informed as possible to have as much information because I know a lot of people, you know, they might not understand or anything, but like you were saying, this is the first point of contact. So if you're coming in there, not knowing anything, having someone that's very knowledgeable to be able to help you there, really helps you out and make sure, hey, you know, this is this does this, this helps with this, make sure you do this. And I know you were talking about uh, the edibles recently and uh, you were talking about, you know, the way to go about that. And, and what what did you say again? Oh yeah, it's my, we call it either microdosing or the start low and go slow. Because um, so often, you know, you may see that there is a gummy and or a chocolate and they do generally taste really well. So you might be tempted to eat several, but really the best thing for a patient to do, because everybody does have a different tolerance level, is to maybe quarter that, and that edible, and then eat that a quarter, and then wait at probably about 45 minutes to an hour. If you're not feeling anything, then, then take the other quarter and build up. But, the worst thing you can do is to try to go in and take a whole one or be like, oh, well, in, you know, say they taken it 20 minutes ago and they've not felt the effect of it and then they start taking more. Well, unfortunately, that could be where they go and see Dr. McIntosh <laughs> because they could, you know, they're going to have some serious THC effects that would be rather scary. So we want patients to... Uh, to microdose or do the, um, I think in the medical world, they use it a good bit, the start low, go slow. And I always have to think if I'm saying that the right way. <laughs> sure, yeah, you know, you know, and that's, I think that's important. I think where we may see some complications that patients don't really follow that advice. And if they get too much THC, they're going to start having those effects that um, maybe you've seen kind of in a debate in the legislature or you know, the medical community of those side effects, right? Kind of these uh, agitations and hallucinations and kind of the vomiting and, and things like that where patients do end up in the ER. And, you know, that brings me back, I guess, to your question about the rumors. One of the ones that I've seen commonly um, is, oh, well, if I get my card, can I just go get it anywhere, meaning off the street? And, you know, there's a couple issues there, uh, obviously the legal ramifications, um, but really just you don't know what's in it. And even if it's uh, from somebody that you've trusted, and et cetera, um, a couple issues that we see in the ERs commonly are that cannabis may have something laced in it. And so there's obviously some, some bad consequences from that that we'll see. But even if it's not, um, the concentration of THC in these products, um, especially in the street, on the street, have exponentially risen over the years. And so what has been, you know, maybe something in the 80s or 90s is minuscule amounts of concentration of THC compared to what's out there today. And so you may get a clean, um, relatively non-laced drug of cannabis from somebody on the street, and it'll be such a high concentration that you could become extremely ill um, and have some severe side effects. And then Aside from that, you still don't know what the quality testing is. And so all the state labs that will be effect are set up to rule out kind of the toxins and the poisons and kind of from an ag agricultural standpoint and fungus, you know, none of that is tested for on, on any kind of street drug. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like you've been saying before, like both of you all have been saying before, we want to make sure we can have healthy patients 
take safe medicine. That is the number one thing out of this entire thing. We want to make people feel better. We want to make people get better. And we want to make sure they're doing it safe and controlled. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. So we're about to wrap up. Um, if you all would just give us your contacts, if you would like anything you would like us to know, anyway, uh, just anything like that. You're talking to us. Oh yeah, 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 yes. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm Angie Calhoun. I am the founder and CEO of the Mississippi Cannabis Patients Alliance. You can email me at angie at misscannapatient.com. Our website is www.misscannapatient.com and I would love to get any feedback, any questions that our listeners may have for me and I will certainly try to answer. And, and the same goes here and you know uh, information is on the website. I think uh, the website is probably just the real takeaway and the token so people can go on uh, on the clinical side so healthcare providers or patients to go and start reading through a lot of this information uh, before it even becomes available. Uh, and I think education will be the, the biggest part here. Yeah. Knowledge is power. And if I would just encourage everybody to not only to go to our website, but to, to research period about medical cannabis and the benefits of it. But there, you know, there can be some side effects. There are some um, other medication interactions that could happen. And so we just want to have, um, you know, a program that is very informative to not only to the public, but especially to our patients so that they can have quality of life through medical cannabis. That's wonderful. Thank you all for coming on. Uh, I'm so really good. glad we could provide this information to people, something they could digest, just can watch it. I'm going to make sure we get this on our YouTube page. I'm going to make sure we clip everything. So if you all need to just, Hey, here you go. It's, it's it's explained right here and everything like that. And I just want to thank you all for coming on again. Thank you for having us, Melvin. Yeah, You're thank the best. You, Melvin. We appreciate you being a resource to people. So oh. thank you for that. No problem. No problem. I just I just want to see Mississippi win. Well, we are. We are gonna see it through. Oh yeah. All right. So this has been this episode of Burning Questions. Uh thank you all for watching. Uh, you can subscribe to this on YouTube. All you have to do is uh, click on our YouTube link on our profile. Also, on our Facebook Live, we'll be doing dual live cast every, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, we are going to announce next week's guest uh, very soon, but I think a lot of people will really like it. Uh, thank you all in the comments that came in. Thank you all for watching and everything. Um, again, thank you to Dr. McIntosh and to Miss Calhoun for coming on. And we will see you all next week. And remember, if you want to listen to this episode tomorrow, we will have this on all your favorite DSPs. So that is Spotify, that is Apple, that is Google Play, everything like that. All you have to do is search MSCTA. And again, this is the Burning Questions Podcast. Thank you all for watching. Y'all have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.